Well, welcome everybody. This is um, Wednesday, August 26th, and um, it's a General Housing and Military Affairs Committee meeting. Uh, today we're going to today we're going to be focusing on. Um, we're going to. I'm going to mute. There we go. Um, if you can mute yourselves, I, I just muted. Ken Gregg, but if you guys can mute. So this General Housing and Military Affairs Committee, we, today we're going to be discussing some military issues. Um, this is our opportunity to get um, work done on several different guard issues that have popped up since we last uh, talked to the guard. So today, uh, we may not get to them all today and, and the one and for the topics that we don't get to, we will, we will have the guard back. Um, to discuss the, the topics at hand. So today we're going to focus on um, the, the primary focus, and if we have more time, we'll go to the others. The primary focus today will be on the Guard Scholarship Program. Um, there is an issue related to COVID where uh, Guard scholarship recipients aren't able to, uh, based on what we wrote, they're not really qualifying for the, for the scholarship because they can't go to basic training. And so there's a desire on, on many of our parts to try to, um, Representative Fagan has been working with the attorney, Jim Demeray, and with the guard on language that sort of allows for an end around during the crisis um, so, that, so that students who do qualify for the guard scholarship can receive the money uh, and still, they'll have to still fulfill their, their um, basic training requirements. But the uh, general will, talk more about that and then uh, to start filling us in on the deployment, um, which is upon us. And so we just wanted to get an idea of that um, and what the status was with that. So with that, um, before we before we get into testimony, does anybody have anything they, they need to um, share with us? I know that I know that some of us um, need to duck off for a little while and that's fine. Um, duck off the call and then just come back when you're when you're ready. Um, but if I don't, if no one else has anything, if no one has anything to share right this minute, then I'm going to pass the microphone right over to, um, General Knight and have him, I think I, I'm trying to unmute you, General. There we go. Um, welcome and, um, happy summer still. Yes, sir. Thanks for having us. Um, Hello, committee. Hope everybody's doing well and uh, weathering the storm, so to speak. So I'm joined today. I've got uh, Ken Gregg, a deputy adjutant general. He's actually off camera. Uh, Sergeant Major Nate Chipman, who's our state senior executive, uh, senior enlisted advisor, and Major Kurt Kaplan, who's our judge advocate general. Uh, there were some questions, perhaps, about use of guard troops. Uh, if we talk about it today, that's fine. Uh, we can also do it on another day, depending on time. But um, I'll, I'll jump right into the. Uh, the basic training issue that we run into with our education entitlement. So COVID has certainly derailed a lot of things and basic training for both our Air and Army National Guard uh, have become a casualty of that. So training and doctrine command or uh, on the Army side and likewise on the Air side has been forced to move training dates uh, to the right. In some instances, very far to the right, which drives a backlog. Uh, so normally, uh, in optimum times, you'd find six to eight months before somebody would shift to basic training. Uh, and in this case, it's now extending to over a year. And what that does for our students uh, that have been listed in the Air Army National Guard, they cannot derive the benefits of the entitlement. And that really drives the intent of, of at least giving a, a bridge so we can allow them to go to school, derive the benefit, and that's still with the understanding that they have an obligation um, and failing their obligation, it becomes a loan and they end up paying it back. And so, and so again, this language is basically going to allow this to happen so that recruitment can continue and so that, um, and basically, again, we had to create an end around for this to happen. This is the language that, that the attorney is going to present to us. Yes, sir. That's, that's true. It, it should, until we can get things back on track, um, and, and our both Air and Army training commands can eventually refine the process, inclusive of quarantining if they're on the backside of COVID, uh, that'll be how long we'll need this uh, amendment in place. 
Okay. Um, Representative Kalaki. Uh, yes, hello, General Knight. Uh, the other day, I, I just want to make sure that other committee members know this, that there is a, already a signed agreement, right, with everyone ab about this, about making sure that they do the basic training. So, it, so when we allow this for the students to go back in the fall, if for some reason they did not fulfill that requirement, they're already bound to do that. So it's kind of a protection. Uh, is that correct? Is, did yes, I understand sir. that correctly? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Representative Walls. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, General, if this is having an impact on, uh, on recruitment and uh, just being able to have the, uh, the personnel that you need, it is having a positive impact. Uh, and of course, again, with many things, uh, this pandemic has really had a pretty marked impact on our throughput of enlisted applicants because it's not just getting the basic training, it's actually getting them uh, enlisted and into the door at the military enlistment processing station. So there's a lot of subtleties that go into that, but it, it's, it's certainly slowed down our ability to do that. We're still making progress. But I think this education entitlement remains central uh, for many of our students uh, that are joining the Guard. So I'd have to, um, I'll check with our recruiting folks and I can certainly get back to you, but I, I would say that probably 50% of the Army enlistees are um, doing so, citing that as a primary consideration. So I don't think that number's changed much since the inception of this law. Uh, the Air Guard, I think that number's a little lower. It's probably about 30% but I haven't checked on that for, for a while, so I can certainly get back to you, but I, I think it's um, a market benefit for us. And, and as discussed in previous testimony, it's something that we haven't had before. And I think the, the longer we have it and the more it matures and the more informed uh, the public becomes, the better off we're gonna be for it. Well, uh, you know, uh, yeah, thank you. But, uh, you know, part of my concern is if you can't offer basic training now, just how is that going to affect readiness and, and the number of personnel you have ready? Uh, you got a deployment coming up. What is yes, that going sir. to do to you? We, we should be in pretty good shape for the deployment. Um, so mm -hmm. one of our benefits in being a multi-state a multi -state brigade, so within our infantry brigade combat team, there are six states represented. So we have the um, majority of the New England states and Colorado. So this deployment is, while in its entirety is large part the 86th Brigade, it's not just Vermont. So we'll have somewhere between 900 and 1,000 Vermonters deploying, uh, but other units will be coming from our sister states. Um, so we'll have less of an impact there. Long-term, it's a valid concern, and, and it certainly isn't just Vermont. This is a nationwide concern um, mm -hmm. regarding readiness. So uh, I think that the Guard and, and the Army and the Air Force are doing a pretty good job to very quickly address it. Uh, but it still in, entails quarantine at the front end of basic training and likely quarantine and a testing at the backside. So you're adding to training schedules and, and that takes away from the college student's ability to have to miss a semester of school. So there's significant sacrifice here that comes with this. So that'll remain a challenge, but we, we've got our eye on it. And um, again, it's a nationwide problem. It's being addressed uh, nationally. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Representative Trajano. Um, yes, um, General Knight, how are you there doing today? Good, Thanks well, for Good. So just a, a question, having been through basic training, I understand that uh, there are certain circumstances in which uh, injury or illness can uh, halt the basic training of an individual who has the, all the best intentions of getting through it. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm just wondering if this has got a place in this, uh, if this situation has a place in this uh, a modification or amendment, um, and maybe it's better asked to Jim. I'm not sure, but uh, it's just uh, something to come up in my mind. Well, the only provision right now, this is Ken Greg, the only provision right now would be, unfortunately, because they wouldn't be able to fulfill their commitment and would become a okay. I mean, the other language has provisions where the adjutant general is able to waive the debt under certain circumstances. Uh -huh. Depending on the circumstances, 
So for example, if the person was injured in basic training, you know, would that be a valid conversation to talk about the adjutant general having the option to waive the death? There is a provision in the language now that allows that. Okay. Um, but I guess it would probably be on a case by case basis. Okay, thank you. And, and Representative Toronto, there are instances where if somebody is injured um, or, or fails out of basic training due to illness or whatever, um, there is still a window of opportunity for us to have that soldier or airman return and we can in essence renegotiate that basic training seat and, and get them back into the system and, and hopefully get them to, to successful completion. Yeah, okay. We used to call that recycling. It was the dread of every recruit. <laughs> Not to try it again. <laughs> it hasn't changed. Anyway. I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Recycling, even then. Um, the um, is this a, is this a good time to ask Jim to come in and, and walk through the language, General? That sounds like a plan to me, sir. All right, Jim. Um, and Jim, you are co-host, so you can share the screen if you'd like. Um, um, okay, I haven't done it before. <laughs> so, um, your if screen. You... Yep. And where would I find the document? Look at you, James. I thought Judge. Um, I don't know. It would be on your computer screen. If it's oh. not, if it's uh, it would be coming from your computer. Is 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 the road? I mean, we can we can oh. have. Um, if you if you're more comfortable, Ron, are you available to put the language up? Yeah, I'm bringing it up now. Just that's good. Right, right, okay. Thank yeah. Thanks. All right. Give me just a second to bring it up. Yeah, and Jim, you'll just have to be explicit on when to, when to have a shift, when to have the. Yeah, we'll and then after this, General, we'll t we'll talk some about the larger military budget. Yep, we can do that. And then, then Ken's here. He uh, he's very closely engaged with on the budget. Okay. Terrific. Okay. So uh, for the record, uh, Jim Damer and his Consul, we're walking through draft 2.1 of uh, draft bill language for the Vermont National Guard Tuition Benefit Program. Um, begins with a finding and purpose. I'll just read through it because it's quite short. Um, uh, so first it says, um, an eligible member of the Vermont National Guard is entitled to certain tuition benefits for courses taken at Vermont post-secondary educational institutions under the Vermont National Guard Tuition Benefit Program. And Ron, if you could scroll down further. Thank you. Uh, two, um, one of the eligibility requirements to participate in this program is that the member must have successfully completed basic training Three, due to safety measures implemented to address the COVID-19 pandemic, the number of, of available basic training slots has been reduced, making it impossible for members who are new enlistees uh, where are we here, uh, to uh, complete basic training prior to the fall college semester. And then for the purpose of the section to allow these new enlistees to gain the benefits of the program program if they were otherwise qualified to participate in the, in the program. Um, so what this does is section B uh, establishes an interim for my National Guard tuition benefit program. And quickly by way of background, because the members don't qualify under the program and statute because they can't attend basic training, we are setting up an interim program that is the same as the program is statute, except for the fact that it does not uh, include the requirement to complete basic training. Um, so that's, that's how this is working. So it reads the interim Vermont National Guard tuition benefit program is created solely for new enlistees who have not completed basic training solely due to the reduced number of av available basic training slots as a result of safety measures implemented to address the COVID-19 pandemic. The structure 
administration and terms and conditions of this interim program should be otherwise identical to the Vermont National Guard uh, tuition benefit program and statute, except that the interim program shall not require that a member has successfully completed basic training. We scroll down a bit further on. Um, eligible, eligible members under the interim program shall be entitled to this tuition benefit for courses offered by a participating post-secondary educational, educational institutions only during the fall semester of 2020. Um, that is there because if you scroll down further, Ron, um, this is being paid for uh, with um, uh, current relief funds and you can't use those funds after December 30. So it's only be in place until for the fall, fall semester of 2020. So Ron, if you can scroll down a bit further. So the sum of X is appropriate in fiscal year 21 from the current relief fund to the VSAC to fund the tuition benefits under the interim program. And then C says that for, um, for enlistees who want to use the tuition benefit uh, in the spring semester of next year and thereafter, um, and uh, they, if they haven't completed basic training due to the reduced number of, of slots uh, because of COVID-19, then uh, the requirement in the statute that, uh, scroll down a bit further, Ron, uh, the requirement in the statute that they have uh, successfully, successfully, successfully completed basic training is waived. So what we're doing for the first fall semester is we're using CRF funds and creating an interim program that doesn't require the basic training element. And then in the, in the spring semester and thereafter, we are waiving the requirement um, under the uh, statutory program. Uh, in other case, D says that before funds are allocated to a member under B or C, uh, the Adjutant General shall provide verification to VSAC that the member has a re reservation for a future basic training class. And then E, uh, in, the, um, in the program of statute, there's a service commitment. So uh, for time you uh, receive tuition assistance, there's a certain amount of time you have to be in the uh, National Guard. And so what this is saying is that academic attendance under the interim program shall count toward the member service commitment under the statutory program. Um, so you're not losing that, uh, that uh, in terms of this, the service requirement. Um, this section is repealed in F. Uh, it's repealed on the date that the Adjutant General certifies to the House Committee on uh, General Housing and Monetary Affairs and the Senate Committee on Government Operations. The all, member, all members who had not completed basic training due solely to the reduced number of available uh, basic training slots as a result of COVID-19 have successfully completed or are currently attending basic training. A copy of the certification shall be sent at the same time to the Office of the Ledge Council. And the effective date of this section is retroactive to August 17, 2020. That's it. He's got it down still. Questions? Clarifications? Uh, Representative Kalaki? Yeah, thank you. I, I'm just wondering for the uh, re retroactive date to August 17th, it, w why is it that date? Because I believe that's the date Norwich, uh, uh, sorry, that's the date I was given by, I think, Rep. Fagan, I believe, uh, as the beginning of the school year for maybe Norwich, I'm not sure. That's correct. Um, this is Ken Gregg. The retro date is to cover the students that were enrolled in Nor Norwich that had already showed up as cadets. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Further questions for Jim right now? I mean, this is, this is, this seems, um, for all of the, the words, um, this seems to provide the, the workaround that we're, 
looking for in order for these folks to continue their their education um, while they wait to do the basic training. Um, General, had you seen this updated language previously? Uh, not this version of it, but um, this is along the lines of exactly what we're looking for. I spoke briefly with Ken about it during his construct. Okay, and this is, um, and this is only to be to be to be clear again. This is only to apply during basically the emergency, right? As soon as we're sub, quote unquote back to normal, um, this we revert back to the uh, the requirements that exist right now. Is that is that your understanding? There it is. And all right, so what else do we need to, to, to know um, from this? I mean, it looks fine. We have um, Representative Gonzalez and Triana. I have a question, but I think it's actually more um, for the guard. Um, one of the, the language that jumped out for me was about um, uh, reservation for future uh, class, um, future, I kind of um, scribbled a little bit, but so wondering about that, that language and just how that process works, um, particularly since classes keep getting pushed out and we don't know kind of how long that is. So um, again, this is a question for the guard rather than for our attorney, but um, uh, wanted to ask that. Yes, ma'am, that, that's actually a, a valid piece of this uh, we have to have a reservation date for our future members uh, that's part of the process and it's one of our, our measured areas for success with either on the air guard side what we call our future flight program and on the army side the um, recruit sustainment program and our success rate with getting reservations getting our soldiers and everything into that training pipeline all of that um, feeds our measurement as a state nationally. So this is a logical addition to this. It makes sense and it solidifies the fact that there, hey, there's an agreement here. And so as as things get pushed out, as uh, trainings get pushed out and kind of remade, uh, those are those reservations are just continuing along with those date changes kind of thing, or do people are they getting cleared off and then re-adding? What's that that process for having reservation as the dates keep changing? So basically, uh, basically so, I don't want to, I don't want people to miss things basically. Right. So since um, this thing really began for us in earnest back in February, the process has become uh, pretty refined and it's more a, a matter of how we do business now. It's all been taken into consideration. So we're gradually catching up and rescheduling the previous reservations. And it's a little more streamlined now uh, with new enlistees and they're getting their reservation dates much more quickly. They still may be a year out but at least we're getting dates on the calendar. Great, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Representative Triano. So that's uh, sort of where I was going. So if a, a, a young person, if an individual goes into the recruiter um, and um, signs all the papers and documents uh, to um, enlist in the National Guard, um, then they are given um, a potential date for um, uh, commencement of, of basic training. Is that what you're saying, General? Yes, sir. So when they go to MEPS as part of that enlistment process, that's mm -hmm. when they'll get their initial date for basic training. Um, the backside of that is, is their actual training for their specialty, uh, their Air Force specialty code or their Army military occupational specialty. Yeah. Uh, those are separate training dates unless they go under, in essence, a one-stop unit training where they do it all at one shot. Um, a lot of our folks, what we call split option training, will do your basic training, for instance, during one summer, and then the following summer you do your training. Okay, yeah, that clears it up. So um, I read this this morning when it first came down, and um, it really seems to cover everything quite well. And uh, um, I think it spells it out. I don't see any uh, potential uh, problems or issues with it. I would uh, support uh, something like this. Thank you. All right, any further questions on, on this bill, on this language? Um, can I assume by, um, I guess by show of blue hands, um, 
to approve this language that we can just have this passed over to um, appropriations and that basically that we approve the concept because the language may change yet again but at least in terms of what this is I would imagine that this is the language we would like to pay, have passed over to appropriations um, I see um, if it, you know there's just hit your your, your blue hands um, I have uh, eight so far And then by that number, we will pass it along. But Mary Howard, I, your, your hand's not showing up. Mary and Randall and Representative Zott. Mary's putting her hand up. Okay. Um, all right, then. Um, all right, let's go ahead and lower those. Bing, bing. I don't know how to do it in one fell swoop here. Um, all right, well, thank you, Jim. I think we're all set. If that's language that we will let, um, we will uh, let appropriations know. We'll send a note with that that this version 2.1 is the it, that we approve of the concept and that this is the language that we approved. Um, if it does change substantially, please let us know. Sure. Yep. Um, and um, but we'll do that at some point today, and and let them know that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so moving on to the next, the, the larger budget. Um, General, again, half only half of us were there last week, and so if you could just review um, what the governor proposed. And and how it was handled in terms of I mean it seemed that those of us who 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 um, watched it, we didn't seem to have any in, indication that there was a problem with with the um, budget as it was represented by the administration. Um, so if you could just fill us in on what you had. Well, I'm going to swap places with Ken. Ken uh, manages our military department budget. And I will step out of the way and let him answer any questions. And if I can provide refinements, I'll do that. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Um, Good afternoon. I guess if the thought is a general overview of our entire general fund budget, is that what I'm assuming? Or you want to talk specifically on our overall tuition budget? Well, there were two things that came out, um, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't ask for the um, information that was provided that showed the changes. It's more about the changes. I think we reviewed and and basically gave our blessing to the budget such as we knew it earlier this year. We we had sent a memorandum about a bunch of different subjects. Um, what I heard last week uh, in appropriations was was two things. One was um, while the scholarship program itself needed this fix, um, and while there has been success, that there were funds that you were returning, um, but also that there were other funds that were coming in and out that changed your budget. And that, I mean, I imagine everybody was asked to do a 3% change in their budget and I just and and so I think what we wanted to hear was um, what those changes represented what the give backs why you know if you were going to cut your budget by this much you know were the give backs part of that cut or was it something separate and then what how are the budget cuts um, the budget proposal cuts to uh, to the military budget how do they affect you in real time absolutely so based on the budget instructions of 3%, our share based on our general fund budget was $173,000. Um, $37,000 of that was related to service-wide costs, the uh, interagency service-wide costs such as HR um, and IT services and stuff like that. And the other 136, we actually took, because there was room to do so, a reduction in our tuition base. Um, so we'll talk about the tuition. 
So the governor's recommended budget in this winter was 1.426 million for tuition benefit program. And as we've refined the estimate, we've come down to, with a couple of things that have happened. Uh, number one, with the deployments, we're gonna have members that won't be using the benefit. And number two, the Air Guard effective one October is also receiving federal tuition assistance, which is the additional up to $4,500 of assistance. So our money is gonna go further. So we've come back and said, well, we um, would recommend a million twenty-six thousand for our tuition budget, and um, which subsequently left four hundred thousand available for for reduction. One hundred and thirty-six of it was uh, taken for the general fund overall reduction reduction, and the rest is being which is about uh, 264,000 is being um, considered by House of Probes as a reversion so that we don't erode the base, maintain the base for future years, but to take it as a reversion um, this year. With all that said, the military department's budget is basically operationally refined. We're not going to be negatively impacted. We're able to meet payroll uh, benefits and our operational needs and meet our match to our various federal programs that we have to provide. So, so we're, in, we're in really good shape going forward for, for 21. And where are um, no? It sounds like it sounds like the, the deployment is um, kind of uh, financially as as it, I don't know makes it interesting. I don't know uh, what the best phrase is. Uh, it how does how does the upcoming end? And we'll get into the deployment, I suppose, later in, in details. But just in terms of the finances, um, at what point isn't there a point where? payroll is met by the federal government when they become, when they get deployed overseas? Actually, when we talk about payroll and benefits, we're actually talking about all our state employees within the military department. Which are much which less than, Which yeah. is 160 of them. Some of them may be in the guard and some of them may deploy um, and be on leave of absence. But pretty much when I was talking about the deployment impacting tuition, Obviously, it's the fact that they're not going to be here to take classes, so we won't be using that that money. They'll put their education on hold while they're deployed. So again, so the message that that I'm hearing first off is that the three percent is not going to negatively impact you in this current fiscal year. Correct. As long as, and then and then there's that caveat. Uh, um, for the, for next for the next fiscal year, as long as your base isn't eroded, on like, on the tuition piece, that's correct. Yeah, um, and it's it's a tuition the rest piece. Of our base is fine. Okay, Representative Triano. Uh, yes, I'm just curious that now when a deployment takes place, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, logistics uh, to get a uh, thousand troops um, to a uh, foreign country, for instance, uh, where they may be deployed. Um, you know, uh, is that paid for by the federal government? Um, air air tra travel and, uh, and uh, all the other uh, shipping of equipment and logistics, is that covered by the feds? Yes, sir. That's it all 100% that's all federally funded. Okay. Very good. Thank you. The um, the tuition funds now. In memory of when we uh, helped you build this program, was that the that there was going to take some time to get up to the full par value of what you were seeking. Is are you seeing that as a? I mean, you we've talked about it being a successful program. Are you seeing that right now as um, uh, this gap? This this sur I mean the surplus you, you you just testified some of it's because of the federal money but are you seeing the usage of this program going along in the same pattern that you uh, expected? 
I, I think we're about a year behind because I testified earlier, I think um, with appropriations during the winter, uh, we were slow getting out of the chute for the first year launching and uh, getting our recruiters up to speed and getting everybody understanding and getting out into the schools. So uh, it looks like we lost eight, 10 months. So, but what we're seeing going forward is it's definitely trending in the right direction. We're seeing a, a marginal uptick of which we're anticipating 20, 30, 40 students, you know, between 25 and 40 students a year is at the, and we're saying over a four year period, um, we think we'll be at a four to five year period, we'll be at a steady state where we think that number will be somewhere around 200, 210 students realistically, based on averages and historical numbers from other states. The, uh, the number that's been a difficult target is, is actually coming up with a sound or a solid estimate um, because of variables like the deployment is gonna cross two fiscal years. Um, so it's gonna take a hit, a little bit of a reduction or less money used this fiscal year coming. And then the following state fiscal year as well, there'll be, it'll cross both years. Uh, so that variable, and then when we put together our estimate, then what we didn't have knowledge that the Air Guard, Air, Air, Air Guard members were gonna be afforded federal tuition assistance, which obviously is a big number. If we have a hundred people, for example, in the Air Guard doing uh, the education benefit, and they're all allowed $4,500, there's all of a sudden there's a $450,000 reduction in what we would be otherwise asking to use. So we're trying to uh, work within those moving targets and try to make as realistic an estimate as possible. That's why I felt comfortable this year, and, it, and I felt it was appropriate to go back and say, I think we have 400,000 more in the estimate in the budget than we really need. And that's why we identified it early so that it could be available. The, the original intent of the, of the scholarship program was to um, supplement your recruiting needs and your recruiting needs you, I had identified last year at a, at a, in order to replace um, people who were moving out that I, if I remember correctly, the number was around 300 per year. Um, are you seeing that, are you seeing this um, scholarship working again in that way where the supplement, where it's supplementing um, any recruits that you're having that are non-students? And are you coming close to reaching um, what you had identified as a par value or is that too kind of a shifting thing um, just uh, over think, time, depending on what's in front of us? Yeah, I think there's two different dynamics. I think uh, it looks like Anecdotally, that the again we've had fifty percent plus of the Army Guard folks identify the tuition benefit as their primary interest in coming into the Guard. So on the Army side, that equated to about a hundred enlistments. So that's that's a real that's and who know I mean somewhere between sixty and a hundred is that real number that that made the decision truly because of the education benefit. The interest also is the demographics. We're seeing more um, enlistments in the coming right out of high school demographic, whereas our, our low end demographic before was more of somebody that was out of school two years, year and a half, two years, three years, trying to figure out what to do, oh well, let me go in the guard. Uh, so we're seeing that benefit, the, the, the target base of, of being able to get to the young people that are trying to figure out how to pay for school and what that next situation is. I think another real strong benefit has been the fact that it affords trades and certificates. So we're seeing that benefit as well uh, because it's created the flexibility for people that aren't necessarily interested in just going to a traditional college situation, but can still um, gain a trade or a skill. And again, these folks are part-time. 
mostly the, the, initially the, yeah. initially um whether they become full-time in the workforce or not you know that's who knows they have to get through school first yes um any further questions for uh, for ken with respect to um the overall budget um again it's it seems like it's a minor change that they can live with and that's where we you know again that's what we have to kind of give our blessings to uh the appropriations and those of us who heard the presentation last week didn't have a didn't have an issue with it um does anybody else have a any questions or can or for this one you want to just do a thumbs up um you know basically our decision on this will will just be reflected in a very short memorandum or email actually just to say that um that we're okay with this budget um change or, or presentation so do we get that um all right matt oh matt you you use this hand good job uh, <laughs> the um all right, so so what I'll write to the appropriations committee and I'll CC everybody is um, is that we're okay with this with the military budget and with the language for the scholarship. Um, all right, General, I may have to thank you, Ken. Thank um, you. Now, uh, General, if you want to return. And um, the next thing we had was the an update on the deployment itself and the planning and the execution of what's going on. Um, do you want to do that or do you have, can you reintroduce, actually before we do that, can you reintroduce the folks that are here sure. with you? So in addition to myself and Ken, I've got Major Kurt Kaplan, who's our Judge Advocate General. He's my subject matter expertise on all things military law. And then, so I made your Nate Chipman, who's my uh, state senior enlisted advisor. So he represents the non-commissioned officer enlisted members of both the Air and Army National Guard. And these are not the folks that we've talked about in the recent past about your the new hires that you made? Nope, uh, you can, uh, I can arrange to have those folks here. Yeah, us. okay. No, I just wanted to make sure if they were, if they were the ones that we had been talking about, then we would um, certainly not make them come back again. Um, but um, seeing as that they're your right and left hand people, um, we'll just have them come every time you come, I suppose. Um, Representative Triana, do you have a do you have a hand up on this? Or is that a leftover? I do No, um, I just wanted to take this opportunity uh, briefly to uh, while well, the generals here is to report that um, uh, my attendance at the uh, Northeast Regional uh, Veterans Affairs committee last week, um, the undersecretary of VA reported to us that um, in regards to the uh, burn pit legislation that we had passed uh, last year, that um, the VA now has um, uh, an additional um, uh, uh, burn pit um, registry that they're using. Um, the undersecretary told us that there have been 10,000 awards made for disabilities with uh, regards to um, uh, suspect uh, 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 medical conditions as a result of burn pits. Um, I was really happy to hear that. I thought that um, the VA's action, reaction and action and reaction to um, this burn pit, um, uh, which I don't know if it started with us, but uh, we sure did put some effort into it. Um, and I am so gratified to hear that the VA is uh, acting in this way. And I just wanted the general to know in, in the event that he didn't, um, or, or and his staff to know that in the event that you haven't uh, heard this, um, I am just really gratified that this is happening. That's outstanding, Representative Triano. I, I appreciate the legislators' work on this, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be able to testify. Um, and we're going to continue uh, getting that word out. Uh, I'm still not satisfied that we've reached out to, to a sufficient number of veterans that are exposed to burn pits. Um, and there are some ways that, that Mr. Gregg and I are going to work to get at that. Um, I did send out uh, a quick legislative update um, last week, a five-pager, kind of hitting the wave top. And one of those things is to use the system that, that Ken worked with the state folks on to come up with and making it mobile um, and getting beyond 
the like the dot mill or dot gov firewalls that we deal with and actually making it much more streamlined. So I think by leveraging the VFWs and legions and publicizing it in town hall forums, we're gonna be better able to get veterans to come in and actually uh, register for the drug kit. That's what I was hoping to that would happen uh, when we uh, worked on this legislation. So I appreciate your work. And if there's anything I can do to help, please let me know. Absolutely, will do, sir. All right, so let's move on to the, um, the deployment. Where, where are we? So we're in the midst of, of preparations. We've had um, annual training uh, ongoing, and we've got another one coming up uh, here in October. And if any of the committee members are interested in coming up to uh, our Ethan Allen, Camp Ethan Allen training site and, and visiting soldiers, I can certainly send the dates out. We're happy to host you here, um, bring a mask. Even though we'll be able to maintain social distancing, it'd be great for our soldiers uh, to see you. Uh, so in, in the update, um, that I sent out, we've got uh, operations mobilization, uh, mobilization and deployment. So that's coming up during the winter and spring of 21. So it'll be here pretty quickly. And so we've a number of units, originally about a year ago, I did a public service announcement. We received a notification of sourcing, which simply means the army has turned on funding. And that's, that's to, to fund training and to fund equipment coming into Vermont to get our units ready to deploy. Since then, a number of units have received um, an alert order, which in layman's terms, makes it much more real. So if we're on a patch chart somewhere, meaning this unit is aligned with this, what they call a force tracking number, you're assigned to a specific combatant command. So in this case, unlike in 2010, when the brigade deployed to Afghanistan as a unit in its entirety, um, in this case, as noted in the uh, summary, we're going to different combatant commands. And basically that's driven by the combatant commander's need for troops. What mission are we doing? So if for instance, it's a force protection mission, the training will align with that and the construct of the unit becomes in essence a battalion task force. So there could be elements of an engineer unit, an engineer company or platoon. It could have reconnaissance elements to it. So in the end, the brigade is taken apart and made into these battalion task forces and again, it's a multi-state brigade. Um, and those units will go to, in this case, European command uh, to different locations. In this case, this one primarily, it's an enduring mission, will be Kosovo. And then we'll go to Africa command and then to Central command. And all of those, I don't have all the details yet, some of which I'm simply limited in what I can share because of operational security. Um, but in all cases, um, the training and, and funding aligns with specifically that command and the supported commanders in that theater. And again, that's gonna be winter and spring uh, coming up pretty quickly here. We'll have kind of a staggered departure of units um, and the time on the ground is about a year for most units. So concurrent with that coming up very uh, near term, we have um, a deployment with some of our air guard folks. Uh, this is a non-flying mission. These are our support personnel. It's called a reserve component period where we'll mobilize for a period of about six months, um, a lot of support personnel from the wing, and they will go to different combatant commands. In this case, it's primarily uh, Central Command, and they will support with personnel, logistics, uh, airfield uh, operations, those things that um, are most needed, and they will go to that combatant command and support units already in theater. And then that, that term of uh, Deployments, it's a much quicker rotation for the Air Guard, and we'll have those folks back here in about six months. How will that affect local training for the Guard, Air Guard? Uh, for the Air Guard, uh, operations will continue. Um, most of the folks, if there's any impact at all, it'll be in the, the admin uh, field. And a lot of those personnel is perhaps medical personnel supporting clinic operations and uh, logistics. But we'll be able to continue operations um, and the intent obviously is to, is to get uh, that wing operational. Uh, that's part of our federal mission. And, and that's, um, so how many people in total? Uh, should be between 80 and 90. I don't have an exact number, but it's fewer than 100. From the wing. For the air guard? From the wing. And then what about for the army and guard? The army of okay. and, and how much? Between 150 and 1,000. So that's just about a third of the force there of the Correct. army force. 
And those are specific, uh -huh. that's what impacts Vermont. There'll be more soldiers from the brigade that come from our five sister states. Right, so I mean, I just, so when you've done, been doing the training, you, the guard was notified several years ago that, that they were on tap for this time period. Um, and so is there a sense of, I don't, I don't know if relief is the right word, but I mean, you didn't know until recently that it would be this many or this few people, is that right? It was all part I mean, of the factors. We, we kind of knew what the missions were going to be. We didn't have perhaps a degree of fidelity that we have now, um, but for our soldiers, um, and, and certainly anybody who's in command, what you find frustrating is, is to, to put your soldiers and units through their paces. Um, and we've done numerous collective training events, and we're probably the only infantry brigade in the Army, for instance, that's gone to the Joint Readiness Training Center about four times in the past 10 years. That Nobody does that. And, and we're able to do that, and, and we did it very well. But that, in in the end, it becomes kind of a treadmill. Um, so you're really grinding your your soldiers through these training things, and there's kind of a no so what. What are you using us for? Um, and they want to go, they want to deploy, and they want to make a difference um, doing these missions, and then come back to Vermont and continue doing what we're doing. For instance, in response to COVID, um, our soldiers and airmen are all in with that mission but that doesn't take the degree of training, and certainly the degree of, of complexity, challenge and collective training that we have when we go to a JRTC site, type scenario. So in a situation that we're in, um, a pandemic, um, we're gonna be putting together a whole bunch of people who are gonna be going overseas to a different place where there's gonna be potentially different strains of the COVID perhaps out there. What, what kind of precautions do you, do you know of that are happening on the bases overseas that will um, uh, that just pay attention to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, it starts with, for instance, the, the mobile post mobilization training. So, for instance, if they're mobilizing out of uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, or Fort Hood, um, they go there and they quarantine for two weeks. Um, they will do the deployment, and then there's going to be obviously a time allocation on the backside of the deployment to quarantine for two weeks, or short of that you know, seven day quarantine and testing. And we just had a, a smaller version of that with our, our air guard uh, who traveled with about 250 members to uh, Volk Field in Wisconsin. And I, they work with our counterparts there who, who to me be, kind of became the example. It's, it's a remarkable job um, coming in. They, our, our airmen were screened. They flew via military air. So no commercial air it was in essence from a green location being Vermont to a green location that was sequestered from the rest of Wisconsin, a very specified training area. Um, they were tied to the training area for the two weeks. Um, and then upon departure were tested, again, coming back through via mill air, short of a handful of folks that traveled via commercial air or over ground. Uh, and those folks are tested when they get back here to Vermont. Um, knock on wood, I don't want to jinx anybody, but we've been very fortunate and had no positive tests come back from that exercise. So the mobilization will be on a much larger scale, um, again, with those battalion task forces. But once they become a Title 10, they're mobilized and put on orders for Title 10 to do this federal mission. Uh, it becomes the training site's um, responsibility to make sure that they're trained. And we'll be monitoring on the backside of that when they come home. It'll again be a quarantine period, short of a vaccine. And, and we'll certainly continue to look at um, our test capabilities here when they come home. Representative Kalaki. Thank you. Um, I, 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 in, in terms of the uh, deployment of the Air Guard, um, are other Air Guard members from other states joining us in this deployment? I, I, I was walking around my neighborhood and a new family had just moved in and I was talking to, to the mother of the children and she said, oh yes, my husband's in the air guard. We've just moved from Wisconsin. So I, I, I've not, so I don't know if that count as a Vermont air guard person or did, are people moving from other states to join us in this deployment, I guess is my question. Well, sir, there are people that certainly come to Vermont to join us. I would welcome any and all who want to do that. Um, this, in this case, it may not necessarily be just for the deployment. They could have come here for the opportunities uh, that we offer here. 
Uh, there's another piece of that, um, something that the Air Guard does and the Air Force is doing is called total force integration. And that's bringing active duty members. So in our case, we have the 315th uh, fighter squadron here integrated with our wing. And that helps integrate and, and get that, uh, that organization operationally ready. Once we achieve our operational readiness status, the 315th, which is an active duty unit, transitions out and we become wholly national guard again. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, so General, one of the, um, well, go ahead, Representative Triano. So um, I guess I was just wondering now, uh, will this uh, deployment um, have any impact on the readiness of the guard to um, participate in food distribution or any kind of an emergency a, a within the state, General? No, sir, it should not. Um, we've been planning for that. Uh, and again, it's, it's less Vermont and more the whole of the brigade approach involving all six brigade states. So we will have, as with previous deployments, a, a pretty robust rear detachment headquarters, a command here. In this case, it will be the Brigade Support Battalion. And inclusive in that, we've got a Garrison Support Command, um, which is our aviation unit, and the folks that run, can't, run Camp Ethan Allen training site. And then we've got the Regional Training Institute. So we, we've got uh, resources in place, and the intent is to not lose any capacity or capability in response to domestic operations. Good. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, and we will, that's correct. So we will also have a thousand airmen remaining here. So General, uh, thank you for all this on the, on, the, um, on the deployment side. I would like to focus on where the support for the families is the preparation for that. Um, one of the things that happened um, with the deployment 10 years ago was that there was a real rebuilding of the family services units and, and how they were able to reach out both in the buildup. Everybody knew at the time that it would be a substantial deployment. And while this may not be as substantial, there are certainly um, 950 families or more that are going to be affected by this. Uh, what, what programs are in place to make sure that, especially during this crazy time, that um, families have the support that they need, again, both prior, um, during, and, and after? So we have, well, in, in large part, uh, it starts at the unit level, and you have family readiness groups uh, run by volunteers, uh, by spouses. Uh, the unit tracks a phone tree, and there's significant communication between the unit and chain of command. Sorry, General, I can't hear you. I'm wondering if we can pause while the F 35s go over so I can hear oh, the answer because I'm okay. very interested. Hold on a second. All right, how are we? Um, that was third of probably eight, so it'll be um, a few more minutes. This morning, they when they flew over, they flew over in threes, and then there's another pause. Um, so I, I can hear now. Okay. Thank you. So we have family, you have uh, starts at the unit level with family volu with volunteers. Yes, sir. We have family readiness groups. Uh, and then at the state level, uh, I would argue we have probably one of the best uh, family programs in the nation. So part of that is uh, the military family and communities network. So it, it kind of branches out from just us, but there's a number of resources that they uh, bring to the table and, and all of that is kind of brought to the families through yellow ribbon events. So significant discussion prior to deployment, making sure that families understand all the resources that are available to them. Um, I had the opportunity to go speak at these uh, prior to deployment and certainly when they return uh, because everybody goes overseas, you see different things. We again reiterate a lot of the uh, resources that are available. Um, we also have on the enlisted side, just pause for one more moment. Okay. No. One more? Uh, you never know, um, but it sounds like the coast is clear for now. 
Okay, thank you. I'll be flying six this afternoon. So, uh, Sergeant Major Chipman uh, can add to, to some of the uh, discussion regarding resources offered to families. Hey, thank you, sir. Hello. Um, so, just uh, just to shed a little light on this, um, as uh, as the units work up towards their their window to deploy, and then during the deployment, and then uh, post deployment, this is something that's tracked in what we use. We refer to as like a commander's update brief that the units, even from the company, the battalion, and even the brigade, would track their family readiness group readiness in order to be able to sort of um, uh, be able to provide all those services for the families while our our soldiers and airmen are, are downrange um, doing those uh, doing that Title Ten mission. So um, just the other night, this is last week, I, I stepped into one of the eighty six. Uh, IBCT's um, commander's update brief, and this was um, this was a topic of discussion during that brief to the commander. So it was, uh, it was really nice to see that all of the all of those things are in place and being tracked uh, all the way down to the company level. And in fact, the uh, the family readiness group uh, leader, uh, she was there uh, being able to brief all of the readiness uh, for each of the family readiness groups. That are from the companies and the battalions and all the way up to the brigade. So this is something we, we track uh, uh, very well and something that we take uh, very seriously as we move forward into the deployment and then during the deployment. And then of course the yellow ribbon piece afterwards is uh, something that this, the state level here we keep uh, oversight of that as we uh, track as folks come back. Um, so I hope, I hope that helps to clarify a little bit on the, the family readiness group support network that we have yeah yeah i it, it does it just the you know i think one of the things if i were if i were a spouse of of a service member and i had one or two or three children uh during a time when it was very who knows what public education is going to be like in terms of this that um we know that these families have a lot of stress to begin with i mean we we have done a very good job with the yellow ribbon ceremonies and with with other uh, programs that have again been in place for the last 10 years that have identified the family members as being an incredibly important part of a deployment it just the idea that there will be extra added stress because of the pandemic or because of educational difficulties or what have you I'm, i hope that the resources are my my expectation would be that the resources are there to manage, to help families manage um, being a single parent and homeschooling your kids, if that's the way that the, if, that, if that's the way this goes, um, has to be one of the most stressful things that's gonna, that's gonna be out there for the next year. Yeah, I would agree. And central to success, um, as I mentioned, is that rear detachment headquarters. Um, they really are the liaison um, between us and the families. Uh, that's a significant part of what they do. I think probably our biggest challenge is with any organization of this size is, is going to be effectively communicating with everybody. So we're certainly revisiting that. Um, we actually have the Air Guard has an app. The Army should have an app, which is a very efficient way uh, to get information out very quickly and at least uh, prompt somebody to read it or do, a for, do further research on everything that we, uh, we offer for resources. Hey, Representative Gonzalez. Just clarifying in terms of definition of family, when you all are thinking about that and reaching out, or, uh, I know a lot of what you have is uh, directed towards children. As and as Tom, as um, Chair Stevens talked about, that really in this time having that extra support around uh, children that are homeschooled. Just wondering, um, and I can't remember if when you talk about family, if you're also talking about. Uh, legally married spouses or partners or kind of where that squishiness comes in. You can talk about that a little bit. There's, any, there's nothing in the family readiness program. Usually it's whoever is identified as the family by the service member. Yeah. Hmm. So. Yeah. so did you hear that, ma'am? I did. And so do, in terms of that, does that also mean parents or um, other, other folks in an extended family network if the service member is identifying them? That, that's what we've, that's what I've seen in the past personally. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Great, thank you. 
All right, further questions for general on the deployment? I mean, I think we're going to, I mean, I, I know we get to only know what we get to know through pr the press um, or when things are happening, but if there are elements of the support system, is, I mean, when we come back in January, if we, you know, I suspect we'll need a, uh, an update and make sure that you have the resources available. Because again, we while while this committee can't determine what your military strategy is, um, we certainly are here to make sure that the people um, that are involved, the families, and then and then the folks when they come back, have the resources that um, and have access to the resources that are available. So make sure, um, please, to keep us in the loop in terms of where you see that there might be a need for for those resources. Um, Absolutely, we'll do that, sir. You know, it's, it's. Um, I mean, I know I don't, my kids have aged out of school, but I've seen families since their kids were, you know, 10 years ago, um, you know, so they were 10 or 12 years old. And um, it's been interesting to watch them grow up with, with multiple deployments for their parents and, and, and see how the system has been able to help them. Um, but that, but knowing full well that there have been issues that that needed to be dealt with um, simply because of their service. Yeah, very much appreciated, sir. And we're we're not shy. I'll also reach out to the congressional delegation. Um, and Senator Sanders has been uh, really wonderful in, in ensuring yeah. um, our family programs uh, remains as ready and as robust as it is. All right. Thank you. Uh, anything else? I, the other um, topics that we had to talk about with you are, um, and we will arrange another Zoom meeting perhaps next week um, or when you're available next, sometime before the end of the month um, of September, of um, finding out about the new hires that you've made that are perhaps in relation to the not only to the uh, provost marshal, but also to the other programs that are um, career oriented or that may be gender oriented um, or diversity oriented that we've talked about in the past. Um, certainly there was a bill that got a lot of, um, I got a lot of discussion of um, H401, which was the chief diversity officer and, and this committee chose to go in the direction of the provost marshal at this time, but but we also want to meet those hires and we want to in the way that it was represented at the time was that you felt that there would be some overlap with what the direction we were going in with the provost marshal and some of the hires that you've made and i'd like to be able to meet them and hear the direction also you had a pregnancy and career initiative that that um has started uh and then the other subject matter was something that came up i, I mentioned this to the committee yesterday was the idea that um constituents have been concerned about the notion of the guard possibly being federalized to be um, here on here on uh, home soil and I'm sure that you we would probably just need a real clarification of what your role is what the guards role the Vermont guards role is in um, situations like that but I don't we don't have we don't have enough time to go into that in detail today and I want to make sure that that gets uh, a full hearing. So we'll reschedule you in. Outstanding, sir. If there's any um, uh, amplifying questions uh, regarding the use of the National Guard, um, any specific points of concern, if you send those along, I can get those to Major Kaplan and, and he can uh, do the research and, and be better prepared to answer. That um, is doable. Yeah, Representative Triano. I just wanted to follow up, General, on your invitation to visit um, uh, the range uh, and some of the troops. Um, so um, you, I think you might have my, you likely have my email address. I would be interested in coming over sometime and uh, um, have a helicopter ride. No, just kidding. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> all right, I think I think I know a guy. We can make that happen. Okay, it's good with me. Just let me know, General. Yes, sir. I, I would look forward to seeing you, and that goes for any any members of the committee. Um, so that'll be, I believe, mid-October. I will confirm the dates and send that out to uh, Representative Stevens. And anybody's interested, we can certainly make accommodations and, and get you out there for a visit. 
That'd be great. Thank you. I, I mean, it's foliage season. Are you sure there's room for us? Um, <laughs> anything further for the for the general and his and his folks? Um, thank you for taking the time uh, to 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 talk us through some of these these issues um, and for 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 filling us in on the budgetary issues and the scholarship so that it's, it's helpful for us to just check that off our list. Um, and I'm glad to be able to get you in as, as early as we were able to. This is gonna be a busy month for all of us. And so um, I appreciate you taking the time. Outstanding. And Thank doing you that. all as well. And so, all right, you are free to go. Um, you can click you. right off, yeah. Um, Thank you. And committee, um, we are going to get right back to S237 tomorrow. Um, I've asked Ron to make some invitations of um, people. That, again, the list that was shared with us from the Senate was extremely long. Um, I don't know about you, but I've been getting quite, uh, VLCT has activated many many of the planners and, and others on this. And so we have, rec I've received a, a number of requests and we'll try to fulfill what we can. So I've asked Ron to invite, um, again, we, we have such limited time. So we're just really trying to keep it. Um, so tomorrow we're gonna hear from David Hall on the rest of the bill that he worked on. And then, um, Ron will let us know when the agenda changes about um, who else. I mean, um, do you have, Ron, do you have a, any, did you, were you able to get any invites out or? I, I, I sent out to the three people you indicated, uh, Karen Horn and Chip Sawyer from St. Albans and uh, Peter Tucker from uh, Sotheby's Real Estate Management. I've heard back from Chip in St. Albans that, uh, He's on board. I haven't heard back from the other two yet. Okay, and it may be that. It, well, and that's that's fine. Um, so we will we will hear more about two thirty seven tomorrow. Um, again, because this is the end of the biennium. Again, I mentioned this yesterday. We will be working on this is the housing bill. Um, so there are some some stray things that are out there that are. Um, that we will discuss and um, attach to this bill after discussion, um, including H7, elements of H739. There's a bill, um, S187, that got um, sent to Human Services. And, and it's a small bill, and it has to do with allowing um, a place like Harbor Place, in, in, which is a transient um, temporary shelter, uh, it allows people to live there for more than 30 days without being kicked out for a day, which is right now because of the way that landlord tenant law is. And we, we, we talked about this a lot with the, um, with the recovery residences is that if, if you stay in a place for 30 days, um, you are a de facto tenant and, and eviction law goes in, but there are exceptions to that law that where if a hospital in, in particular is, is paying or others are paying is, are paying for the um, for the rentals that there's like a nursing home or something like that where there's um, people don't become tenants in in that way they they would be able to live there for uninterrupted right now the, this the world that we live in now if you are homeless and you go to this you go to um, Harbor Place you, you have to leave after 29 days um, for a day and then come back and so that's a little awkward in terms of in terms of the overall so that's what that bill contemplates it's a it's a it's about i won't say it's simple but it's very straightforward and um it's possible that human services will take it up but it's also possible that we would be um dealing with it in committee and we'd have testimony on that representative clacky uh chair can you give me an understanding on friday we're going to be on hearing from all the, the stakeholders in the $85 million housing plan we put together. Yeah. What are, what are we, what is our committee's response? Are we supposed to, if things are undersubscribed or oversubscribed, are we supposed to then recommend where to move money or 
Yes. Just so I understand when I listen. To yes. The, the, the short answer is yes. Um, okay. The, the way the budget process is moving is, is that, um, and this was again mentioned yesterday in the, in the appropriations committee meeting was um, they're looking to be done by next Friday. Um, and so, yes, we will get an idea. And again, I think we're in a place where unlike the business, the business programs where the subscriptions are oversubscribed because everything was first come first serve and, and, and it went out fairly quickly. Um, I think we're going to hear for the stuff with this, with the housing is that the programs have stood up. There have been some, there have been, um, a lot of applications, but not as much money quite yet. But again, we, we think that it's not, you know, come September 1st, after a month of not having the $600 extra in the unemployment that there, we may start seeing um, more need for back rent um, come up. And so that, so we're, I think we're in a slightly different place where there's more prognostication, but I think in the end, what we're going to, yes. So the, I'm going to go to the short answer of being yes. And um, we need to, by the end of this month, we need, we need to allow the Joint Fiscal Council, which will be our, our representatives for the rest of the fall, um, some flexibility if more funds are needed in any particular, for instance, if foreclosures, um, we didn't put a ton of money into foreclosures, right? We put $5 million. If, if we find out that they need two or three or $4 million more, that the Joint Fiscal Council will be able to do that. So yes, we'll we'll, ident we'll start to identify where the needs are, um, and and okay. how we can and how we can um, do it. The, the, those are the cards we have. They're the same cards we left with basically. Um, again, because the federal government punted on on um, the Senate punted on on having a, a solution until at least September eighth at the earliest. So, um, you know, we we have to move ahead with what we have. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, thank you everybody. Um, we will see you tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Um, have a good evening. Yeah.